Welcome to lecture number 12 on the visualization of graphs. Today we want to talk about beyond planarity. So we want to talk about drawing graphs with crossings, but where there are some restrictions on the type of crossings that can occur. In the first part we want to define some graph classes and some drawing styles for those graph classes. We have looked a lot at planar graphs. In planar graphs, we have a drawing in the plane without crossings. So we have one forbidden configuration that looks like this. We cannot have a crossing between two edges. We say that a graph is plane if we are also given an embedding. And for planar graphs, that's equal to defining the rotation system. So the order of the edges around every vertex. We can recognize those graphs in linear time and we have looked at many different drawing styles. For example, we can do straight line drawings. We can do orthogonal drawings if we have degree at most four. We could do grid drawings where we have bands and at most three slopes. Or we could do circular arc drawings. There are of course many more, so this is just a few small examples. Now what about non-planar graphs? Here we also have seen a few drawing styles already. For example, the force directed drawing algorithm works for any graph, it doesn't have to be planar. We have the hierarchical drawings, there we can also have crossings. Or we could also use the orthogonal layouts via the planarization, where we first find an embedding and then place a dummy vertex on every crossing. In general, however, not all crossings are equally bad. We had this example here earlier, where we talked about block crossings. Here we have six crossings, but we don't mind those six too much, because they are very close to each other, and basically they form a bipartite graph. So here we have one block crossing and another block crossing, and while this is ten crossings, we only see two clusters of crossings. On the other hand, here we have four crossings, but they also only form two clusters. So this doesn't look much better than this here. On the other hand, there are some other things. For example, these three edges that cross this one, that I also don't mind so much. Maybe it's because they all share a common vertex. So what do we know? What kind of crossings are good for us and what kind of crossings are bad? There have been a lot of studies and experiments for this, and there's one I want to point out by Yi Hong and Wang from 2008. There they did some eye tracking experiments. In the input we had a graph drawing and some designated path like this one here. And the task for the users was to trace the path and count the number of edges. Here it seems to be quite easy, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But in this example here, it's much harder. And here the path has many crossings, but it's not only the number of crossings that we have. The results that they found was, if we have no crossings on the path, then the eye movements are smooth and fast. If we have large crossing angles, then the eye movements are still smooth, but are slightly slower. If you look at this crossing here, that's a large angle, so it's very easy to still follow the path after the crossing. But in some of the examples here, for example, it's quite tough. You go in and then you have to find the correct edge where you have to leave again. And since these angles here are very small, you have to concentrate to do this. Here in highlight it's not so hard, but if you remove the highlighting, then it gets quite crowded here. So. In this part it's tough to find the correct way, in this part it's tough to find the correct way. So if you have small crossing angles, then the eye movements are not long as smooth and they are very slow. There is a lot of back and forth movements at the crossing points. So that means it's great if we have few crossings and if we have large crossing angles. And to have few crossings on the path, it's not only important that we have few crossings in total, but also that all of the edges aren't crossed too many times. So from these findings, some beyond planar graph classes can be defined. And we do those by defining aesthetics for the crossings and by finding bad crossing configurations and avoiding those. I will show you a few examples here. 
The probably most prominent ones are the k-planar graphs, in this example for k equal 1. Here, every edge can be crossed at most k times. So for one planar graphs, every edge can be crossed at most once, and these are our crossing configurations that are forbidden, we cannot have two crossings. There are k quasi-planar graphs. Here we can have many crossings per edge, but we cannot have k edges that cross pairwise. So for k equals 3, we cannot have 3 edges that pairwise cross. For k equals 2, we cannot have 2 edges that pairwise cross, that means for k equals 2, it's just the planar graphs. There are fan planar graphs. This is related to the observation we had earlier. Here an edge can be crossed by many other edges, but they all have to have some common vertex. We cannot have two independent edges that cross the same edge. And we also talked about the crossing angles, so we can define the rack graphs, that are those that we can draw such that every crossing is at a right angle. So we can have crossings like this, we can also have many of those on an edge, but we cannot have smaller ones. Well, there is quite a difference between these types and this type here, it's because these are topological graphs. Here everything only depends on the embedding, so we don't really care how the edges exactly look like, we only have to know which edges cross which other ones. And here it's completely geometric, so here we need the exact coordinates to figure out if the crossing is at a right angle or not. There are many more graph classes that we can define. For example, IC planar graphs, where IC stands for independent crossing. Here, all the vertices can be involved in at most one edge that is crossed. So this is forbidden because this vertex has two crossed edges. There are fan crossing free graphs. That's basically the opposite of fan planar. Here we cannot have fans that cross, so all the edges that cross another one have to be independent. And there are skewness k graphs. Here the question is how many edges do we have to remove such that the graph becomes planar. So for skewness 2, which is this one here, we can remove the two gray edges and then we get a planar graph. But here we have to remove 3, so this does not have a skewness 2. There are many more of those and there are also combinations. There is an almost infinite number of graph classes that you can define and that you can analyze. There are many drawing styles we can do for the crossings when we, uh, we have identified those graph classes. The most prominent one is the rack drawing, where we have right angle crossings. Special cases of those are orthogonal drawings, there we automatically have right angle crossings, or slanted orthogonal drawings. Here at every vertex we only use vertical and horizontal segments. All the edges are polylines of vertical, horizontal and diagonal segments and the crossings are only between diagonal ones. So here we can clearly see what are the crossings and what are the vertices. Well, here it's a bit tougher. And there are the block or bundle crossings that we had a look at earlier. How do we do it in real life? If we look at this example from the Kaiser Wilhelm Brücke in Trier, we can see well, this bridge goes above this one. So basically the bottom street is partially removed here at this crossing point. If we do that for a graph, then it would look like this. These are so-called case crossings. Now what many people don't like are these small parts in between here, where we cut through an edge but we have an interior part. And if we disallow them, then we get partial edge drawings. Here we have symmetric partial edge drawings, so for every edge we remove some part in the middle, but the stub that remains on both sides has to be exactly the same length, so that it's easier to find where it goes. And we can restrict this more, we can do symmetric homogeneous partial edge drawing, where the part that we remove is the same ratio for all of them. Then again it makes it easier to find the target but also it makes it harder on a first glance to see what is the structure of the graph. Instead of node link drawings, of course, we can also use geometric representations. We learned about bar visibility representations of planar graphs, and we can extend this 
to non-planar ones. For example, bar one visibility representation. If we look at the k5 here, and we have a bar visibility representation, we cannot do the whole one because it is not planar. And in fact, we don't have the edge between d and b. But if we allow crossings here, so we remove one small part of the e, and we lay a visibility through it, then we get our bar one visibility representation. And here the one means that every visibility can jump over one other bar. Then k visibility means that we can jump over k bars. And in fact, every one planar graph admits a bar one visibility representation. We can also use visibility between larger objects. If we have thickness two graphs, that means that we can decompose the edges into blue and red edges, and both the blue and the red graph are planar. This is always the case for one planar graphs. We, they always have thickness too. Then we could use rectangular visibility representation, and in such a way that the vertical visibilities are blue and the horizontal ones are red. Graphs that admit such a layout have at most 6 and minus 20 edges, and it's MP hard to recognize them. On the other hand, we can do it in polynomial time if the embedding of the input graph is fixed. There is a whole lot of questions that we can ask for those graph classes. And I show you here an exempt from Beppe Liotta's talk at Sausage 2017. There, he gave a very nice summary on the type of problems, on the type of questions that we ask. So what are they? We can ask density questions. So how many edges does a graph of a given graph family have at most? We can ask the recognition problem. How hard is it to recognize if a given graph lies in such a family? And there are differences between the variable embedding, where we are only given the graph, and the fixed rotation system question, where we also know the order of the edges around all vertices and are not allowed to change it. Note that already for one planar graphs, the embedding and the rotation system is not exactly the same anymore, while it is for planar. We can ask the stretchability question. So if we have a one planar graph, can we always draw it straight line without changing the embedding or such that it's still a one planar drawing? We can ask relationships. For example, are all one planar graphs also rec graphs? So can we always draw them with right angle crossings? We can consider the aesthetics. For example, what is the area required for rec drawings? Or how many bands do we require to draw a k-planar graph with right angle crossings? We can add further constraints. For example, we require the vertices to lie on circles or on layers. Or we want to draw different graphs simultaneously on the same vertex set. And instead of looking at it from a theory perspective, we can also use engineering and experiments to find practical solutions that either don't give the optimal solution or they take a long time, but that can work very well in practice even for mp hard problems. In this lecture we only want to have a look at a few of those and that we will do in the next four parts.